All right. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Stephanie Mueller, and I'm the Membership and Events Coordinator for the Greater Medina Chamber of Commerce. We are so excited to bring you the third Raising the Bar uh, series with Don Hicks, um, our partner from Shake Lee. Uh, this will be recorded, and we will be posting it um, on our website as well as sending it out to um, our members, and we will send it to all of you as well. So this is information that you can feel free to share with anyone uh, that you would like and we'll send Don's contact information as well, but I know he will have it up here uh, for you at the end of this video too. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Don Hicks. Very good. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to, oh my God, the third Raising the Bar with the Medina Chamber and Shakely. So thank you, Stephanie, as always. Jacqueline, thank you and the Medina Chamber for hosting and promoting um, this, this event. And more importantly, Thank you for attending. So my, my goal is to not to make this boring. So I think we, we are sort of webinar out or Zoomed out, um, but I try to make this entertaining and helpful for you. So today we're going to be talking about human capital management. That's a fancy term that I'm going to define. And we're gonna walk through what I think is some insights into how to better run your businesses and run your organizations as it relates to managing people. Okay, such an important topic today. So I always like to start out my seminars or lectures or presentations with a story, all right? So this story I think blends in very well with talking about vision, innovation, and team. In the 1800s, man-powered flight was so important. Airplanes. Uh, 1800s and 1900s. Something I think today we just sort of take for granted. Everyone was trying to figure out how to get a human being into a man-powered vehicle so they could fly. Lots of people were doing it. Um, the most popular, though, person that was doing this and his team was a man by the name of Samuel Langley. Samuel Langley. Samuel Langley was a brilliant person, uh, although everyone was trying to figure out flight, human flight. Samuel Langley was the most recognized authority in this invention. Everyone knew Samuel Langley. He was the most, he was the, the most well-funded. Um, he was actually funded by, at that time in the 1800s, he was funded by the War Department, which we now know as the Department of Defense. He was, uh, had media following, following him around everywhere that he went. Um, very well known, had a strong reputation, really, really smart individual. And because of his status in the media and because of his um, wealth, uh, he was able to hire some of the best experts in the field at that time, science, scientists, engineers, government officials, people from the private sector, nonprofit sector. He was able to build a team of professionals. However, here was the problem with Mr. Samuel Langley. Samuel Langley was motivated by wealth and fame and prestige. However, what he didn't count on was two brothers in Dayton, Ohio, and everyone knows these, these, this name is Orville and Wilbur Wright in Dayton, Ohio, and they own a bike shop, and they were really, really trying to figure out this man-powered flight, how to make it work. No one knew of the Wright brothers. No one had heard of the Wright brothers. They had no funding. They had no budget. Um, they had no team. They had, it was really the two brothers, Orville and Wilbur. But once they found out and figure out, figured out this, this invention in 19, I believe, 1903, December of 1903, and they made that first flight, no one knew about it. They were by themselves when they made that first flight. It was, no one knew about it to the point is they recorded it themselves. No funding, no media. But here's what Samuel Langley made a mistake. 
he heard about the Wright brothers figuring out this flight and he became so enraged. He became so jealous that he quit. Instead of improving upon the invention, he just quit because he was not the first one to figure it out. And now we know the history from the Wright brothers. The moral of the story is, regardless of how well-funded you are, if you're a large organization, have the best media coverage, if you are motivated by vision and innovation, and you are built around the right team, the right people, you can do amazing things that can literally change the world. So with that, we're going to talk about human capital management. We, we are going to define human capital management or HCM. Again, a fancy term that talks about basically, just to sum it up, is managing people, managing human beings within an organizational context. We're going to discuss why is this important? Um, we're going to talk about recruiting. Recruiting, hiring, and retaining employees is a huge, huge topic right now. We're going to talk about some best practices over the next hour. I promise to be done by 11 o'clock. And then we're going to play a real quick fun game. I think it's fun. Uh, a true or false. So, okay, let's get started. Whenever I do seminars, whenever I do lectures, I really have a thought in my head based on my experience and working with organizations on a daily basis. I have thoughts and I experience and come across different things. And I like to test those ideas of my thinking around research. Um, so the research that I did on this topic was actually a little bit dated from 2004. But when I was reading upon this, um, even though the materials from, was from 2004, it really applies to today. And more importantly, it was done by two researchers from Case Western Reserve um, here in Cleveland, Ohio. So a lot of this comes from that. Yes, I have to do a disclaimer. Uh, nothing contained in this content is meant to be legal advice. So we all know that, but just to protect myself and the chamber, I just want to disclose that. So what is human capital management? What is this term? And by the way, if you have questions during this presentation, please uh, feel free to unmute yourself or in the chat. I love the interaction. It helps me, believe it or not. So if you have questions, feel free to interact with me. I love that. So human capital management, the technical term is the strategic approach, strategic approach in effectively managing people within an organization with the goal of helping them, the organization, obtain a competitive advantage and enhance employee performance. Now, I use the word organization intentionally. So whether you are a for-profit business on this call or not for-profit business, if I use the word business or organization is both applicable to for-profit or not for-profit, okay? By the way, a little pet peeve of mine, if you are in a not-for-profit not on this call, I personally do not like the term not-for-profit. Um, I That is a, to me, that is a, IRS tax status is not what you're made of. Every organization, if it exists or if it wants to sustain itself, is for profit. You can't have, you can't spend more than the revenue that you have coming in. So not, not for profits, they really do some great work. But every organization, whether you are running a lemonade stand or um, a mission oriented entity or a for-profit pri private uh, for-profit private business you have to have profit profit is not inherently bad okay is not is when it is obtained illegally is bad or when it's misused or obtained unethically or immorally is bad but for the for for profit itself is not a bad thing so I prefer the term for service or for mission versus not-for-profit. It's just a pet peeve of mine. So if you see me use business, it relates to all types of organizations. But human capital management, in my view, is how to get the best out of your employees, out of people, not the most out of people. Does that make sense? And I do think that there's a difference. Today, 
I think productivity is an all time high for all organizations. Organizations are doing more with less. And that's not the issue. Productivity isn't the issue. It's getting the best out of people. And in the past, when we talked about human capital management, human capital management or administration was seen just that. It was, it was seen as an administrative function. An administrative function was doing paperwork, payroll, benefits. All of those things are important and require the day-to-day -day operations. But the future, that is changing and is changing rapidly, almost on a daily basis. The labor market forces are forcing a change when it, um, when it uh, applies to human capital management. It is requiring strategic thinking versus administrative thinking is you have to hire the right people. Everyone is fighting for the same type of talent these days. And there is a push for ethical and cultural leadership. Ethical leadership is doing things the right way for the right reasons. Cultural are things like diversity and so forth. And by the way, it no longer matters. Human capital management, having employees, it now applies to whether you are a new business, just starting, whether you are a small business, medium-sized business, these terms no longer only apply to large organizations. There used to be a time it only applied to large organizations. Um, that is no longer the case. The global economy, the dynamics of business, the di dynamics of social issues and social economic issues are forcing all size businesses to deal with managing the complexities of employees. By the way, I talked to my mom a lot and she said something wise to me about a month ago. Um, whether you involved in a church, um, any type of organization, whenever you have more than one human being together, there is a potential for challenges, right? I believe that. And I talk to businesses sometimes and they say, oh, Don, everything is great in our organization. Everyone loves working here. And I just don't buy it. Either you just don't know about it, but whenever you get more than one human beings together, working together, there's a potential for issues. So the question is, how do you manage that? How do you deal with it? And how do you get the best out of people, not the most out of people? So why is this even important? Why even talk about it? Well, the first thing, when we're talking about when we're talking about smaller or startup businesses or newer businesses, you have some very unique challenges. You're not established yet. And a lot of time, a new business or a small business, you have fewer resources, you have fewer financial resources, and you have, there's more challenges in regards to getting access to funds to do the things that you want to do for your employees. And that is a huge challenge. In order to grow, sometimes a new business or a small business or, or even a medium-sized business, you have to, in order to compete and sustain yourself, you have to build alliances with others, even sometimes um, making an, an alliance with the competitor. So for an example, if you have a competitor that you know is out there, you're competing for the same customer, sometimes a larger competitor, there is a client um, that they do they can't service or they may not want to service. So some companies build an alliance with them says, hey, if you have a number of clients or customers that you can engage with or don't want to engage with, send those to me. So we're seeing a shift in some of those alliances. Is it the ideal situation? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. But in order to grow and sustain yourself, um, I am seeing alliances being made across the board. Um, some companies, in order, order to grow and, or sustain itself, the company have to mirror larger organizations. They have to project themselves as a larger organization to gain the resources that they need. All of this brings some incredible amount of challenges because all of that stuff is made up of employees, okay, and human capital. Human capital is, a, is an asset um, that can be leveraged. Now, I call this the doing business as dilemma. If an organization, pretty, pretty intuitive, okay, but I do want to point it out because it talks about recruiting and 
employees, if an organization grow in sales and production, it also must grow in number of employees. Okay. So if an organization grows in sales or production, it also in an ideal situation grow in the number of employees. Here's the challenge though. And it's becoming the number one challenge for organizations, whether you're new, small, or medium, is what if you can't find the talent that you need? What if you're selling on the type of employees that you are looking to hire? What if you can't retain your employees, all right? And more devastatingly is what if one of your employees, your best employees or a couple of employees go to a competitor? You know, that is the challenge that most organizations are facing right now. And what I see is smaller organizations, in order to deal with this, a lot of the internal employees, they wear multiple hats. And some of these specialized skills in regards to recruiting and employee development, some of those specialized skills are not being fully developed, are not being fully, de fully developed. And the reason I know that is, is opportunity cost. Opportunity cost says when you are doing one thing, that means something else is not getting done. So if you are in an organization where you are doing benefits and payroll, you're doing collections, you're making some sales calls, you're doing multiple hats, maybe you're doing inventory, um, maybe you're doing marketing. If you're wearing multiple hats, that's how a lot of smaller organizations deal with it. There's nothing necessarily wrong with that. You have to do what you have to do. However, the only point I'm, I'm trying to um, point out is, is when that is the strategy, there is a cost associated with that. And that's an opportunity cost. So if you're bogged down with administrative functions that do not generate revenue, that means that generate or re revenue generating activities may not be fully um, be getting done. So this, there's this interference with tasks and responsibilities related to revenue production. This is one of the biggest, what I call the silent killers in organizations. And if you are a new startup business out there, really pay, start to pay attention to this right now. Even if you are the only employee right now, or if you have one or two employees, start thinking about this because I see organizations evolve when, when we're talking about human capital management, they evolve the wrong way. And they say, you know what, this, this human resources stuff, this human capital stuff, I'll deal with that when I get to seven employees, or I'll deal with that when I get to 15 employees. And I'll deal with that when I get to 50 employees because of healthcare reform, when I'm forced to do it. But by then you've built a culture that is hard to get out of. You've built a norm that is hard to um, get out of. So start these practices now, which we're gonna talk about some of the best practices because of the opportunity cost, okay? And what I see in a lot of organizations is when you wear multiple hats or if you have employees wearing multiple hats, sometimes those responsibilities get become someone else's responsibility where they really don't have any formal experience in this. It's sort of a on the job training or learn as you go. And again, I'm not saying that there's anything necessarily wrong with that. I'm just pointing out that that is not the ideal, the ideal way. It is not. There's a cost asso associated with that. And that cost is opportunity cost. Remember, when you're, doing, when you're doing one thing, that means that something else is not getting done. And all of that is human capital management. So let's talk about recruiting. Um, some of the challenges. Recruiting absolutely by far the number one challenge I see for most organizations by far. You know, when I think about my experience and I've been doing this for about 24 years now, um, in 2006 or seven, the big evolution was technology, cloud-based technology, right? You know, payroll processing, data management, all of these fancy tools for organization, that was really, that's when Apple, the iPod, all of that stuff was coming out, right? 2007, um, where things started to go. And that was the sub-evolution of the technical evolution, okay? 
Then in 2009, 2010, the other evolution, evolution that I saw was around healthcare reform. The evolution was around healthcare and benefits. And now I see the third sub -evolu evolution, if you will, and this is recruiting. The number one challenge that most organizations, if not all organizations are dealing with, and it is a monster. The challenges for smaller firms um, with respect to human capital management and recruiting is that your organizational identity is not established and or confusing. We're gonna talk real here a little bit. Um, when you're recruiting, and I see this all the time, and maybe you've, you've, you've heard me make reference to this in previous lectures, but I'm very big on this. There used to be a time 30, 35, 40 years ago that your company's rep reputation was enough to hire the best candidates. So if you are looking to work for XYZ company, you will call Mike who's been with the company 25 years and say, Mike, how is it working for XYZ company? And they will give you the best glowing remarks. And that was enough. You had a reputation in the community. Everyone knew XYZ company. It's not like that anymore. Your company's reputation is on the internet. Your website is the mouthpiece to your company. So when you're going out trying to recruit someone, it doesn't necessarily matter what you say, how great it is to work for your company. No one believes it because they're going to go to your website and they're going to look at your website and see, does it match? Does the job posting that I'm looking at match what I'm seeing from this website? And if you have nothing to offer on your website and you're not standing out on your website, the candidate will move on. And it will go to another website or another company that talks to them a little bit differently. And I don't see job postings that are matched or aligned with your company's website. There's too much about your company out there that is, if you're not communicating that effectively, you're missing quality candidates. Also, the challenge with regards to recruiting for smaller or new organizations or even medium-sized organizations is lack of fin financial resources. And I want to be re very, very respectful of that. Um, I don't want you to get the impression that this human capital management thing is something that's expensive. No, it's a change in thinking in a lot of cases. It's a change in the way things have always been done. You know, part of my passion is I want to talk to every organization that I can and say, stop doing the things that you've always done. Just because it's always been doing it that way doesn't mean it's the right way, okay? Just because your competitors are doing it a certain way doesn't mean it's the right way. So lack of financial resources, however, is very important. There's an ambiguity in compensation when you're getting ready to hire your employees. It's confusing. And the reason I know it's confusing is because I see job postings that says um, salary based on experience. What does that mean? So does experience alone make it a good employee? Does someone with 20 years experience, are they better, are they a better worker inherently for someone that's been doing it for five years? Why? Why is salary based on experience? And the question you have to ask yourself, experience, does that automatically, automatically, keyword automatically equal the right to a higher salary? The answer to that is no. So when your candidates see that, it tells them, okay, I've only been doing this for three years. That way, I'm probably not going to get the best offer. It's confusing. It's confusing. And But I know what you're trying to do when you say it's based on experience, but rethink that strategy. Rethink those words when you're trying to hire someone. Don't make it so ambiguous that it leaves, it sounds squishy to me. And also scarce resources, and I understand the scarce resources, it really impacts how you're able to reward your employees. And how you reward your employees is sort of all over the map um, in most organizations. Again, not 100% of the organizations, and we're going to talk about this here in, in, in the next slide when we're talking about incentivizing and rewarding employees. But some rewards that I see 
are not aligned with what the employee wants. Is not aligned with what the employee wants. So for example, I'm gonna have this on the next slide, but for example, if you hire an older worker, as an example, I'm not sure an older worker salary alone is important to that worker. It could be, or it could not be. Someone that's maybe 55 that has the experience and qualification that you want, offering them a higher salary may not motivate them. What could motivate them because they're at a certain age is access to a 401k plan because they're thinking about the next 10 years of retirement. Do you offer a 401k plan? You know, what may motivate and be really important to a worker is um, time off or time off flexibility. Um, think about those things. It's not just bonuses, commissions, and salary. Some cases it is, but you want to make sure that your rewards are communicated and is thought through. Strategic thinking, right? Human capital management is strategic thinking. The other challenge with recruiting for new startups, small, medium companies, is lack of legitimacy as being considered an employee, employer of choice. So when you're trying to recruit that highly, highly qualified candidate that has 15 years experience working with one of your larger competitors, the question is, do they see you as an employer of choice? And if they don't, you're going to have a hard time um, hiring that employer and that employee. Now, you could have highly, highly qualified candidates that they want to be part of a smaller culture, but you want to ask those questions and strategically plan for that and think about that. Because if you're not seen as, as an employer of choice, sometimes it's very, very difficult to hire that very highly qualified candidate. The other challenge is, again, multiple hats, opportunity costs, right? We talked about that, but multiple roles are unclear. Your job descriptions are unclear when you're, when you're going out and trying to recruit and hire, you know? Um, does the company have a history of starting an employee out with one job title and then you slowly add other responsibilities to them slowly without increasing their pay? commensurate with their additional job responsibilities, or do you just pile on responsibilities um, to those? Because, right, you have scarce resources. You have to wear multiple hats. That's the challenge. That's why I really harped on the opportunity cost, the multiple hats syndrome. I call it the multiple hats syndrome because when it does have a potential to impact employee retention, and if candidates sense that their job responsibilities are going to change over time unfairly, then you're going to really have a hard time hiring those quality, quality candidates. The other thing is I find when recruiting is the strategies are old and they're outdated. I'm going to be real. I'm going to be completely real. And it's all over the place. It's sporadic. In my view, Ineffective strategies for recruiting are taking direct applications, not leveraging social media, not leveraging online presence, um, only relying on referrals, and by, by far, no newspaper ads. Um, I find those to be highly administrative intensive and highly ineffective strategies. Your referrals may sound good on the surface. So you have a great employee and they say, you know what, that Don, he needs to come and work for our company. And most cases the studies show is referrals have a very, very low success rate, very low of uh, sustaining over time. Does it happen? Is it 100%? No, nothing is 100%. But referrals are not the silver bullet in regards to uh, finding the best candidates. And the last one is new hires, a challenge, is new hires based on cultural fit versus qualifications. And that has a tendency to have a negative impact on diversity. And what I mean by that is when you have a candidate, I hear languages, oh, you know what, that Don, he would fit, he would fit in here. Um, why? 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 
So I would encourage you to really only focus on um, the qualifications of an employee versus only a cultural fit. And I see a lot of this cultural language and strategy versus focusing on the qualifications of an employee. Okay. So the recruiting, let's talk about some of the best practices when it comes to, we're going to talk about the best practices when it comes to human capital management. And then we're going to end with talking about the best practices when it comes to recruiting. So to this point, hopefully I've diagnosed the problem. We've def defined human capital management. Okay. We have talked about some of the challenges and highlighted some of those challenges, challenges that I see. Now let's talk about some of the best practices. The first one I can make a recommendation is employee training. Um, if you have large competitors out there, what I tend to find is large companies, they emphasize training uh, on a formal basis, meaning classroom setting, they send them off to formal training, a week or two, two days, they do it throughout the year, all of this formality when it comes to training. Large organizations can get away with that. They have the financial resources to, to do it. What I see with smaller organizations is they don't have the resources for formal training. So it is done, the training is done by activity. So just do it. Or the term people use is on the job training, right? That is doing activities. You're learning as you go, okay? The other thing is socialization. And what I mean by that is um, you have a new hire and you say, Shadow Tom, he's been here. He's the foreman. He's been here for 30 years. And then you follow Tom around and then you socialize yourself with other employees and you learn as you go, okay? There's nothing wrong with that. However, I would encourage you, there are some really, really inexpensive some free courses out there to do formal training for your employees, to do formal training for your employees. Make that part of your onboarding process. Supplement the on-the-job training and learning from other employees with the, your onboarding process. Do trainings, multiple topics throughout the year, at least once a quarter. And what is the development path for your employees? Okay. If you have some employees where managing people is really important to them, what is that development path? What does that look like? What skills are you providing them um, in order to develop themselves and take the next step in regards to productivity and being the best, right? Not doing the most, but being the best that they could be. So really look at your employee training and see how that is done and see if there is improvements that can be, that can be done there. Um, in short, talent is aligned with skill sets and employee development. I've talked about this um, already, but again, it's the multiple hat strategy, okay? So think about this. If you find yourself in an organization where you're wearing multiple hats, right? Or you are evolving into an organization where employees wear multiple hats, really consider about repurposing your employees or your staff that is aligned with two components. One is those revenue generating activities and those non-revenue generating activities. Really understand those opportunity costs. And if you need to repurpose your employees to focus on revenue generating versus non-revenue generating, really highly consider that. Um, that is going to be the best use of your, and ask your employees. Some of your employees, they may be doing some non-revenue generating activities, but they want to do more. They want to do something else. Maybe they're not comfortable doing collections or accounts receivable or making sales calls. Um, maybe they want to do something else within the organization and then determine if, if that is revenue generating or non-revenue generating. So repurposing employees to fit what best fits their skill sets and best, best fits their um, development path, you're going to have happier or satisfied employees that are more closely aligned with their skill set versus it's ad hoc, 
and they're doing different things within the organization. So from those non-revenue generating activities that we talked about at the beginning of this presentation, those administrative things, the payroll, the benefits, the paperwork, all of that stuff, consider engaging a pro some type of professional firm. This is something that Shakely does as an example, but it doesn't have to be Shakely. It can be, be anyone. I'm not trying to sell you anything here, but in, you know, consider engaging some type of firm that handles those non-revenue generating activities while you are repurposing those employees where they are happier, more aligned with their skill sets. And by the way, it is focused on revenue generating activities. So really change your thinking or repurpose your thinking around some of those, um, some of those strategies. The third thing is as a new business, as a small business, focus on what makes you unique. If you take anything away from this presentation, take away that. Highlight on your website, highlight on your job postings, highlight it to the community, highlight it on social media. What makes you unique? It could be we're a family owned business and we care about our employees. That's not enough. You need to de define that. So really step back and, and determine what really makes you unique and tout that. Don't imitate industry norms. Highlight this. Highlight your uniqueness. Document it. What makes you unique? Is it your training program? Is it your benefit offerings? Is it your 401k that you offer? Um, is it because you bring in donuts every Thursday? Is it the company picnic? All those things. Is it the management development path? Whatever makes you unique that is not focused on product, that is not focused on the service necessarily or what you sell. It is what makes you unique internally. That's what's going to set you apart from your competitors is your uniqueness. What makes you special that is non-product related? Again, we talked about the next one is uh, strategic thinking versus administrative thinking. We talked about that. And then make sure your HR policies are consistent. So, so your compensation policies, your rewards, bonuses policies, your benefits policies, your time off policies, all of these human resources policies, make sure that they are consistent throughout the organization. Remember my pet peeve, salary based on experience. That is not consistent. Salary based on experience is squishy. So really rethink that um, when you're doing that. So what are, the, what are some of the best practices in terms of recruiting? Again, we talked about a lot of these already, but I'll just summarize them. Again, your website is the mouthpiece for your organization. And I have seen some horrible <laughs> company websites. Horrible. Get your website. The way uh, is not, it's not very expensive for to hire a professional firm to really redevelop and redesign your, we your website. I don't care if you're one employee. I don't care if you're 15 employees. I don't care if you're 300 employees or whatever. Your website reflects you as an organization. And if your job postings don't align with your website, you're, you're, you're not going to attract candidates. They're going to just move off to something else. Okay. Again, your job postings must highlight your uniqueness. We talked about that. And when you have scarce financial resources, scarce financial resources, I understand that. And that is a factor. Say, Don, you don't understand my budget. You don't understand my situation. I get that. You have limited resources when you are a new or smaller business. But there are some things that you can do that are not very costly. Some of these doesn't have to cost you a dime. So different worksite benefits. A lot of uh, employees are looking for ways to pay for college for their grandkids or their kids. There are some programs out there that provide a college benefit for their family. There are reward programs that you can do today. Your time off policies, um, work from home policies, time off flexibility, 
coming in twice a week and working from home for the other three days. You know, we talked about, you know, an older employee, for example, may not value training and, de and development as much as they value having time off and flexibility and access to a 401k. Okay. That's just an example. That's just an example. So when you have scarce resources, there are some things that you can do is not just paying the employees more. Okay. That's not necessarily the, the be all. That's not necessarily what your employees are looking for. They're looking for what makes you what? Unique. So um, you must attract the attention of targeted individuals. Your strategy have to be interesting. You have to be unique. You have to be honest, right? You have to be honest, but there are so many ways that candidates can look at your website. They can go online. They don't call Mike and say, how is it working for XYZ company? People don't do that as much anymore. Is what's online. What is your presence on, online in, on the internet that's going to attract um, good candidates for you? Um, another pet peeve of mine is making your application process easy. Um, in the past, I'm going to share something with you, okay? In the past, I have literally, not recently, I'm probably talking 15 years ago, um, I had one opportunity that I was applying for. And they did not take online applications. I had to show up at the facility and fill out a paper application. And this paper application, I wasn't even sure if I wanted the job. But I had to sit down and spend about a half an hour filling out this paper application. And it got to the point where I um, stopped and I went to the manager, thanked him for his time, and left. Um, but that was before I even had an interview. It was just too cumbersome. So make your process easy for employees to find you and interview with you. Don't make it so cumbersome and confusing that they just, they just move on. If, if it's cumbersome and confusing and paper applications, it's just not effective. And you will have some highly qualified candidates that will move on. People, we are used to easy. And the reason I know that is because most everyone on this call has an iPhone, right? And you want things quickly and you want to look up things quickly, quickly. And that's, that's no different than a candidate. Okay. The last thing I would say about the app, application process is constant communication with the applicant. There is nothing for an applicant that's more frustrating when they do their part and apply for a position on your, for your company and they hear nothing. Or you say, thank you for the application. We'll call you on Wednesday. And Wednesday comes by, they hear nothing. Thursday comes by, they hear nothing. And you can't have an excuse that you get too busy, right? Or pr some project came up. No. Candidates, that will frustrate candidates. And they will move on. They will move on for, from you. And it creates a very, very bad first impression. Candidates look to see how they're going to be treated during the recruiting process. And if that's how they're going to be treated during the recruiting process, typically that's how they're going to be treated as an employee. All right. So I've had that happen to me in the past where I've done my part. I've applied. I've provided all the documentations. I really want to work for this company. And they say, oh, yeah, we'll call you on Tuesday. And then two weeks go by and they finally call. By that time, I've moved on. And a lot of your candidates. So do what you say you're going to do when you say you're going to do it when you're trying to recruit um, some of the best candidates. And the last one is leverage social media. Please leverage, leverage social media. Facebook, LinkedIn, your website, Google, all of that stuff is a strategy. That's how interested candidates find you. And that's how, how they are enticed um, to engage with you. And this applies to whether you are one employee five employees or a hundred employees. It doesn't remember this is for all types of organizations and businesses is no longer these strategies, no longer are for strategies for the large employers it is not the case. If you are going to evolve, grow, sustain, and attract the best candidates, the best candidates is the fuel for your organization. Okay. Um, it's not the other way around.
your candidates, your employees, human capital, human capital, capital is an asset. Human capital management is managing that assets, which are human beings. And that is going to propel, propel your organization and accelerate your organization into, uh, into the future. So, all right. And so let's take the first question, true or false human, human capital management, HCM is the concept of focusing on administrative tasks versus strategic thinking. So think about that true or false. And the answer is false, obviously. So human capital management, as we talked about, is the strategic approach. The strategic approach in effectively managing people within an organization, right? With the goal of helping the organization obtain a competitive advantage and in enhance employee performance. So, okay. So strategic versus administrative. Let's try another. There is no need for you to consider opportunity cost. Remember, we talked about the opportunity cost. I made it a, a big deal about this. So those opportunity costs, true or false? False. Remember, when you're focused on doing one thing, that means you're not doing something else. And there's a cost, an indirect cost associated with that. Okay. So, and let's take the last one. True or false, recruiting is becoming the number one challenge for many organizations. That, that one is pretty easy, right? And obviously that's true. So right now, uh, recruiting, finding quality employees is a challenge that most organizations face, okay? So thank you for joining me. I really appreciate it. Hopefully you found this helpful and you found the questions a little bit fun. So I did want to make a, uh, a mention. If you're not a member of the Medina Chamber, become one. Contact Stephanie Mueller today. They have some incredible benefits for businesses, for you as far as networking, some discount programs for um, your business and yourself, and tremendous educational opportunities. So if you're not a member of the Medina Chamber, please um, become one today. And if you have any questions for me, that is my contact information on the screen there. So feel free to reach out to me, email me. Um, there's no cost, there's no obligation, and I will be happy to have a conversation with you. So hopefully you enjoyed this. Please tell others about this event and um, thank you for, for joining me. So thanks. Thank you, Don. We appreciate your support and partnership uh, with the sure. Medina Chamber. And thank you for the shout out for our membership. Yes, if anyone is interested, please contact us. But Don's information is on the screen. Uh, so feel free to give him a call if you have questions about any of the content within this video or any other HR related uh, questions or issues. Don is always happy to help. And then we will be continuing these programs um, on a monthly basis. So stay tuned to the Chamber's uh, website, medinachamber.com, uh, for upcoming information about Raising the Bar seminars. If you do have any topic suggestions, uh, please let us know. Don is always open to suggestions, and we're always looking to make sure that these these are relevant topics that businesses are facing. So uh, again, thank you again, Don, for your time. And sure, those you. of you that joined us today, we are happy that you did. And we hope to see you soon. Very good. Thank you.